Welcome to Teacher Seat and Teachers, and we are responding <laughs> to a big announcement um, on Monday um, about uh, a new model at OpenAI. And um, I kind of, the next day, got our tech guy, uh, Jeremy, to up to switch to that model on now comment. And mm -hmm. so whatever you can do through the API, and there are things you can't do through the API yet, like you can't put audio through the API yet. You, uh, and, and there are another number of things you can't yet do through the API that you can do if you go directly to um, Chat GPT and, you, and you've upgraded to that model. Anyway, we're testing out just one little thing tonight, and that is having to do with images um, and I'm going to, I want to quickly do introductions and uh, just check in with how you're doing. And Chris. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Chris Sloan, and I teach high school English and media production and photography in Salt Lake City, Utah. And we are, um, my seniors are done. They, their last day was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And the rest of my school finishes next week. That's our final. So, yeah, it's a wrap. <laughs> wow. You ready? I bet you're ready. Uh, are we ever really ready? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I think I'll be ready. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was a good year. And, um, yeah, moving moving on. Yeah. I'll, I'll go next. I'm Bonnie Breeze Van Trum, and I teach students. Uh, high school students, English language arts in Philadelphia, Philadelphia Public School. And someone said at the PD meeting today, we have 20 days left. Uh, however, I teach seniors and their last teaching day will be on the 23rd. And in the midst of all that, we have the Keystone standardized test going on. So there are late um, admittances happening. And then, um, David, you're the only one that wasn't on. Um, my dissertation was approved, and I will defend my dissertation on May 29th. So I'm excited about that. Uh, and then uh, the other thing, I got two more homebound students. I've been teaching some of our sick children um, that are still enrolled in the school. So I have four uh, students. But I was just assigned two more last week or two weeks ago so yay phyllis you made it yay <laughs> so, hey, phyllis. Okay, okay. so i'm Sorry. doing a lot and know. i and i really i really had a lot of fun with uh, the one student you had Moohoo. i know yeah, i yeah. said well you taught me some things you know <laughs> even just coming in like that so thank you yeah bonnie had bonnie had to take her dog to the uh vet so i stepped in and <laughs> messed oh. up messed around with with one of her students so that was fun um yeah i mean he's from bangladesh had been here a year and he didn't know any about anything about the shooting that happened here in queens which was um, a really horrifying story which once you hear more about it it's um it's it's really upsetting a mother holding her child and saying don't shoot my kid and they shot him right? oh no yeah so i'm just saying Anyway, I, I, it was terrible to kind of say, oh, you're from Bangladesh. There's a story you should know. But but he was interested. I hope yes, he's, he's very he'll follow. And he's I, very interested in the work that you do and AI. So, you know, he was on the hook before he even talked about the story. So, Cool, cool. Great. David. Hi. Uh, and Phyllis, David. we'll do introductions here. We're a small group. but So join us as, as you can. Go ahead. David. Thank you. Yeah, David Cole, I work with NextMap, a small nonprofit that's done STEAM learning and innovation work for years. And I've, I've been following this conversation on AI with Paul through his TTT um, work and other adventures. And I'm thrilled to be here with you all. Debbie. I'm right now coaching a bunch of um, a school, like high school, like, well, high school, build school librarians in uh, San Francisco Unified. Um, and th that's where my interest in helping librarians understand AI is coming from. Cool. Debbie, you're based where? I'm in. Sa I'm, I'm not in San Francisco, I'm in Palo Alto. Right, okay. 
You guys should have coffee sometime, I think. We should. I, I worked with San Francisco Live, San Francisco Unified Librarians a, a, a while back. Did as you? Well. Mm -hmm. and so where do you live now? I, at the time I lived in San Francisco. Now I live in the East Bay. I'm in Berkeley. Oh. Mm. I'll come over and get some cookies over at what that's a great <laughs> cookie bakery. <laughs> Coffee. Yeah, we should. Well, let's connect. Let's find a way to do that. Good idea. Phyllis, do you want to introduce yourself? You're brand new right. here on TTT, but we met you on Monday. So, right. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm in Michigan. It's a little late for me. I've been up since four, so I don't know that I'm going to be with you guys for the whole evening. But I think that it's a really important conversation that we're having, especially about chat GTP in schools and any of the AI tools that will be now coming into the school. So I think this is an incredibly important dialogue and I'm just thrilled to be part of it. Thank you. So you teach what? Where? I, teach, I teach ELA. I teach English. Um, I'm a returning teacher. I took a lot of time off. I started back teaching in the 80s. I took a, a tremendous time off. My, my son went to law school. I kind of went back. I, I've spent time teaching in Alaska. Now I'm back in Michigan. I'll probably go back to Alaska again. So I'm in the middle school right now, but I've taught elementary, middle school, and high school. So. Mm -hmm. And so is what, where, where do you live? Right, right now I'm in Michigan. I'm in Waterford. So I teach in an oh, urban right. setting. I mm -hmm. teach in, in a very urban setting in Pontiac. Mm -hmm. I taught in a very rural setting in Alaska. So it's been really an interesting sort of dichotomy of... <laughs> yeah. Oh, I bet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Um, and I, I now I'll, I'll stay on Phyllis for a second, if you don't mind. We 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 were David and I are coordinating a project for uh, the Literacy Design Collective, um, and um, where we are teachers are looking at student work and coming to consensus about feedback, and then it, that that same work has been fed to um, ChatGPT, and we're bringing. I'm, I'm rushing through this. But we're bringing, we're bringing the ChatGPT response to parents, and mm -hmm. the teacher response to parents, and asking parents what they think of the two things, right? That's a, a very bad summary of the work. But Phyllis very correctly on Monday said, "Hey, you know what? Everything just changed today. <laughs> All this research is old." <laughs> do you want to say it again, Phyllis, or what? What do you think well, about? I, I think that the, the that things change so quickly in this world that the, the research that we've done, which is good research, you know, we had teachers, eight, 10 teachers, all reviewed essays from children all over the country. We were able to draw consensus and then compare it with chat GTP, but now that's old research because now we have 4.0. Mm. So anything that we did yesterday now, and you know, tomorrow, what the projection <laughs> is, what, 18 months, we're gonna have five, is it, I think it's 18 months, five is coming out. Is that right? Yeah. It's gonna be wrong. But I think that every time the ChatGTP grows 10X exponentially with this new generation, now we have new, you know, emergent sort of things that we have to think about in terms of whether it should be in the school systems. Um, Phyllis, I'm not really up on, you said you're doing research. Are you with a literacy? Uh, no, no, no. We invited her to do this with us. Yeah. With okay. David and, yeah. Uh, yeah, but are you doing some research? Yeah. Well, through the the literacy group, through the group, through Paul and David, I was invited to take part of a survey, a, part of a, a cohort. Okay. And so, along with uh, eight other teachers or five other, how many, however many teachers are there are in our cohort group, we were given these essays from children. And then together with my, my smaller group, we were able to come to a consensus, taking those same findings and comparing them with chat GTP. But that the chat GTP, I assume was 3.5. And now we're at 4.0. Was that, was that, is that right? 3.5? Yeah, I don't know what, I, I'm not sure which they did. Yeah. One so what I, I had pointed out, and I, I believe that, you know, we're, we're, our research is behind and, even more interesting, I think, as we look forward to the future is what happens when there is the singularity, when that moment that, you know, all of a sudden it becomes much a, a much larger sort of language model, maybe even beyond a language model. Yeah. I mean, 
It is. I mean, I'll just, I, I, we said this on Monday, I'll say it again. The, um, I do think some of the questions are going to stay the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and as those models take off, there may be models that work in schools just fine, and we don't have to go to the newest one. Um, and that e may even be true of 4.0, right? But um, so, so for example, we're, I, I also help manage a site called Writing Partners, and we have not upgraded Writing Partners. We're still at 3.5 because it's doing just fine at 3.5. I'm not sure we need to upgrade. Maybe, we don't know. But on now comment, we're leaving, we're making now comments sort of the bleeding edge. We're going to keep trying the newest models and see what happens there. Right? Fair enough. So that's some, I, I'm sorry if we're all over the place here. Anybody else want to ask questions or? Uh, you know, one thing is about 4.0. Yeah. I mean, Four, yeah. You know, it's in the session where you raised that. I had, I had missed that. And of course, I went off and read it up, read up on it. And sure, yeah, of course, it's this supercharged model that's showing up. It's a 10x change. It'll continue to do that over the next, you know, probably 36 months or something. I mean, this is all marching towards some approximation of human reasoning, right? Mm. In theory. And everyone's expectation that that's going to represent, you know, AGI or some such. Mm -hmm. um, but to Paul's point, the questions we ask of the mo a writing engagement are not necessarily going to change. The thing that strikes me as changing is how, how does our how do we activate our own questions of the system? Like it's, if it's going to be increasingly sophisticated and able to respond to levels of nuance, it doesn't, it's not able to track currently. So it's asking us to be that much more thorough in our pre-work as we approach these tools potentially. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm puzzled about which end of it to lean into, um, you know, will it hallucinate less? Will it just deliver more holistic, complete answers? Will it, query us around reasoning things that we haven't even thought of and be that much more that much smarter. I'm really curious about where it's going to go as it as it relates to our position as uh, the creators or the drivers of this thing, so to speak. You know, I don't I think, know. Yeah, I've just put that out there. I know it's a little random. No, no, thank you. Um, I, you know, I think listening to Jeffrey Hinton was really very, you know, for me, pretty enlightening. It's like, here's a guy who, who really is the grandfather of this mm -hmm. technology. And mm -hmm. he says to, and he's saying to us, hey, I asked it why it thinks a joke is funny. And it was able to tell me, and I'm here to tell you that this was not in the programming. So I think it's the emerging things that we have to be mindful of, whether it's a closed system or not. There's, right. emer there's emergent sort of, um, we're going to call it deep learning for, for lack of a better word, because I, you know, again, I don't have all the phraseology, but I think it's that's the term that we're looking at, a deep learning that comes that yep. we have no control over. I mean, if Hinton walked away from it because he said, you know, it shouldn't be on the open market. And every time we put an input into it, it is now expanding and learning. Mm -hmm. Now, that could be a good thing, but it could also where I work and you're talking about inner city kids you know, this is not suburbia. You know, there's a lot of children that have some pretty dark thoughts. I mean, I, I think it was Bart that they had to turn it off because it went bipolar with all the input. So Phyllis, let me, yeah. can I, right, that, I feel, it feels like an important moment to address that. That um, through, through the API that we're doing, um, mm -hmm. it, it, OpenAI is not using their data to, to, train their models right it just it just comes back to us so so there is that guardrail there for kids in schools okay the way we're using it but it's a, it's absolutely a really important concern i appreciate it but we've done a lot of thinking about it and on now comment and on writing partners that isn't what's happening Right. So in other words, yeah. this particular program has no ability to morph into and even with the singularity, even with all of the, these guardrails are in there in place so that nothing could ever boost it into some sort of hyperspace or yeah. some sort of I will say I will say their current their current business model at OpenAI is that they want people to build tools around their models mm -hmm. and in order for in order for people to trust to do that they also need to trust that they will not use the data to train their models. So if you're going through an API, they're not using your data, right? So it's just a business proposition at this point. That that could change. Mm -hmm. That's where we are now. 
But anyway, I'm still asleep. I, I, I want to there, jump there in. Probably no. other guardrails that we could build, but yes, go ahead, Bonnie. I want to jump in, Phyllis, because I have to gently push back on that. Um, students anywhere and everywhere can have um, lots of trauma in their lives that are placed into um, AI um, generative spaces um, and not just um, students from inner cities. I just can't let that statement just ride off of me like that. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, um, all right. And by the way, if you if the school system doesn't have a policy, doesn't have a, a program, a, a, um, a platform, a way to access models that do not give it back, and if kids are just doing it on their phones, all ev everything is going to those big models. So mm -hmm. anyway, there's there's some of that art. Let's swing around to Debbie. Debbie, you see, like about 20 minutes ago, you got it started here. Do you want to come back to, oh, well, you've, been, you've been messing around. Do you want to show us what you've been messing around yeah, on? And tell, uh, tell the crossword puzzle story again. Or, oh, if you want, Mike. And then you can share your screen. Okay. Um, I wanted to see what it would do with a picture of a crossword puzzle. My husband does the crossword puzzle every night, and he does it pretty fast. And I wanted to see if I could put the picture of the crossword puzzle with the, you know, the clues, and then ask AI to uh, what the word would be. And I gave it four, you know, four uh, numbers going down, and said, "What, what would you fill in there?" It's a blank crossword puzzle. And then I showed it to my husband because I'm not a crossword puzzle person, and I said. Take a look at these, take a look at these answers. What do you think? He said, well, three of them are right, and one of them is wrong because AI missed that um, the uh, hint is a plural. Mm. And he gave, and gave an, an answer that was um, not a plural. So and, I, I just want, Debbie, I just want to, just in case people are kind of, what's going on here? <laughs> so, <laughs> previously, previously to Monday, we would have to type in, here are all the clues, we would have to use language to describe the crossword the puzzle. Yes. And the clues. Now we take a picture of it. It right. reads that picture. It sees wow. how many clues there are. It sees, right? And it gives the answers, right? So it can read images now is, is the idea. Right. Wow. And, and, I, and there are a lot of other things it can do, um, right? But I, if you don't mind, I, I just want to focus on that tonight because yeah. – um, because when we're annotating like a graphic novel, right? So far we've been sort of like, okay, you can go ahead and, so AI isn't gonna be able to do anything with the images. Or if we're looking at, and there is on the table here, a New York Times article about the portraits of Gazans. If we're looking at war photographs, um, yeah. like AI can't do anything about this, but now it can, um, I gotta, Fast forward and say, I have been doing a, a, some experimenting, and sometimes it's just like AI, right? Sometimes, and when you describe it first yourself, it kind of can stay on track and do a good job of describing the images. Um, if you just say, hey, what do you see here? It makes stuff up. It's like, <laughs> so anyway, so it's not perfect at all, and you have to be patient with it. But one of the tests, and if you want to click on um, the massacre of uh, Black Wall Street, and you can kind of follow along. But Debbie, you're going to try to share a screen and show what you did there? Yeah, yeah. I, I um, looked through what he's describing here, the massacre of Black Wall Street. It's a series of first text and then graphic Debbie, images. Debbie, do you want to present? Oh, sorry. How do I do it's that? Okay. Down at the bottom, there's a present button. Oh, yeah, I see it. Okay. And then okay. there's choose window and then choose that. Okay. So okay. this this is a graphic novel-like um, article that was in, I think it was in, I forget what it was in, Harper's? or I, I'm not sure it which said, magazine. Yeah, it said it was in um, the Atlantic. At the Atlantic, yeah. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. The um, And... Sam Reed uses this all the time. 
mm -hmm. all the time. He's, he's used it for three years. Um, and what's nice about it is that kids bump into other students there. So they've been annotating this um, for that amount of time. Debbie, do you need help with? So, yeah, do you want me to show an annotation or do you want me to? Just bring it up and we'll look at it. Or do you want you me to bring it up and you talk? Whichever. You, you, can't, you can't see it right now. I have it on my screen, but. No. Oh, I clicked. I clicked. Let me look. Go. Um, you have to choose the source and can't. then you have to hit start. Ah, sorry. I thought it was No, starting. perfect. You got it. Okay. okay. Okay, so it starts out the, um, with some text to give context to the, to the images that follow. Mm -hmm. um, and ki kids are commenting, you can see here, kids are commenting on the text. But then it moves into um, mm -hmm. images about mm -hmm. the Tulsa massacre, mm -hmm. which are done as gra in graphic graphical form mm -hmm. um and they they do have captions but one of the things that was bothering me as i looked at these these images in particular mm -hmm. was that they um let me go a little bit i'm going to go quickly right okay um is that the images of the guards the sheriff mm -hmm. whatever were you know kind of these undefined law sources and mob um and i thought and there's trucks back here and i'm thinking to myself well wait a minute this is an interpretation what do i know as a librarian where is their stuff that i can look at so what i actually did was i went to the university of tulsa archival catalog where they have a certain amount of digital materials about um, scenes from the race riot. The fascinating thing about this, which really, um, really got me interested, is that the National Guard, um, there's a picture here, of National Guard and machine gun crew during Tulsa race riot. Um, are you showing, are you showing a different tab now? Mm -mm. Oh, you're not seeing that, huh? No. Okay, sorry. So I have to go back and change the tab. Mm -hmm. and how do I do that? I close this maybe and share again? Yeah, that's one way, yeah. Okay, so next. And now, where is my Ah, there. Can you see it? Perfect. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So what fascinated me was two things. One... Why after World War One was there such an uptick? That was a question I, as a reader, had. But even more, who are these guys that are, you know, bringing their stuff in? There's some in, in, there's some drawings around, you know, military figures, but nothing, nothing about the military guard as far as I saw. Just quickly. And the most stunning thing about this is that. This is on a picture postcard. So these photos, um, uh, these photos are, what's the other way I can move um, uh, a new tab? Do I have to go, how can I, if I if want you, to- If you go to a new tab and there's and if the, there's a little thing that hangs down that says view tab, you click okay. that, then we see it, yep. Okay, so let me just show you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. Can you see that now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. These are all postcards. And it, postcards? Postcards. So freaking me out, right? And I'm remembering that um, with the child labor stuff, the child labor stuff, the Heinz photographs are also were turned into postcards. These are things people sent to each other. So then I got on to, okay, now I'm going to do this thing where I'm going to go to another tab just quickly. I'm, it's, this is just my own thinking process. I go to chat, and I'm going to share this tab and send. Can you see the chat? Yeah. yeah. What I did was I put 
that one of these pictures, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That why was this picture entitled National Guard Machine Gun Crew during Tulsa Riot made into a postcard? Okay. And then started getting um, some response, some of which is, you know, not very interesting. What interested me was this thing. There was a likelihood of public interest and curiosity. So, you know, afterwards you send a postcard and say, look what happened in this next town from mine, or, you know, who knows? Postcards were popular and relatively mm -hmm. expensive souvenirs and collectibles. Uh, creating and selling postcards of newsworthy events. Um, it, uh, reflect social attitudes of the time, reinforce certain narratives and perspectives. So really what happened was I was following it, this train, trying to understand how the graphic images and the actual photographs differed mm -hmm. and then why. And why, you know, after all the graphic, and I'll stop sharing so we can, um, yeah, so now how do I go back to you? Oh, here. You're here. So yeah. what, what, what was- Hi, Marina, by the way, go ahead. What was in my mind, and maybe you can help me, is when we present images to students mm. as fact, we are, we are failing to remind them that every image is the product of a point of view, much as a text. And I think what I would do if I was doing this, this as a teacher is that I would have presented a graphic novel image, the photograph, and maybe mm -hmm. perhaps another version of this, and said, what is, and maybe even asked chat, why are these images, what, what do these, what does the medium of these images and the authorship of these images contribute to the conversation, something like that, mm -hmm. around perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I think the thing that troubled me most about showing just the graphic I, one Don't, don't assume that, Debbie. There's a, whole, there's a whole collection of resources that, that Sam uses. Um, that's not but, the only one. No, and, but, and, and, um, but, and but, and original but, sources is, he uses original sources in, in, in the yeah, yeah. No, but, but what ahead, troubled yeah. me was that yeah. continually, I think kids see a picture as fact, whether yeah. it's a photograph. They do. Right? It, TikTok, it, Instagram, and, all that stuff. And it's even all fact. That photograph is a postcard. Mm -hmm. It is not a fact. It is a postcard image created by someone who took this to sell it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to. So that's Debbie. what I've been playing around with. <laughs> no, I, so, I, I so Debbie, did ahead. you? I want I want to know. So the image itself that we see in the graphic novel, did you put that in behind that's the actual what I, image? That's what I was gonna do next, but it was five o'clock. Yes, okay. that's exactly what I was going to put the second image into chat and say. What does this contribute to your understanding of right. this thing? I mean, I think that's the way you sort of feed it. Yes. And see how it makes sense of it, and then have the discussion with as a kid with chat about what what each image contributes to our understanding. Yes. Does that make oh, sense? It, yes. Yeah, there are a lot of workflow issues going on here, and I'm listening to them. Um, I and I hear how you're using chat and how you could imagine using it. I would could make a case for that you could take one of those postcards on now comment, put it right next to um, the image there, and then ask and and then ask AI to do that analysis. Could in my mind, that that would all be a, a little bit tighter, but I uh -huh. but I know it's not the natural flow of how people use chat. I get it, right. but yeah. But so, Paul, yeah. that's true yeah. because um, like Chat GPT is blocked in in the Big Eye in the Sky server in mm -hmm. my district, but the children have it on their phones, 
And so they would have to do just like Debbie did and use it in their phone and correspond. Yeah, but there are ways we can do it. Or now comment together. Yeah. Can we come back? I mean, do you want to try to do that now? Or I would love to. I, you know, there, I didn't want Phyllis to has her hand up, though. Up. Phyllis, are you waving goodbye? Or you said, do you have a <laughs> <laughs> I, I, oh, I think I raised my hand wrongly, yeah. but I, I guess I, maybe I, I, maybe Chad GPT knows I have a question. So <laughs> doesn't it take literature to? It's not just the pictorial renderings. I mean, it's read everything that there's ever been. There's tons of literature and there's tons of artwork regarding World War I. I mean, there's modern artwork. There's more, you know, there's, there's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So my question, I guess, would be, doesn't, especially the newer models, the language models, aren't they taking the literature and then creating things that are predicated not just on what exists, but adding their own twist? I, and I don't know. It's a yeah, question. The language I'm, models are doing that. You're saying? I, I I'm asking. I I'm asking. Um, I was looking at one of the comments on the the massacre um, mm -hmm. thing there, and I noticed like Paul, you had used the Can reading. We go there? Can, yeah. Can, Can we go there? Yes. So. So let me, I, I, Debbie, I want to get back to the postcards and, and how we can might connect them. And I think it's a really good yeah. project to think about. But I, I need to go back a step and just kind of show the experiment that I did on, right. on the massacre, right? right? So Chris, do you want to share what you're seeing? And then um, I can talk about it or shall I share it? Here, I'm going to put the, um, just quickly, there's the link to the particular comment I was looking at. Um, um, okay, so so okay. I'll share, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, okay. And I guess my you know, I was just looking at the comment, so I won't, yeah. Say so I'll, I'll go ahead, you you talk it through while I get this up, and I'll then I'll explain what I did. Yeah, so it's a picture of uh, two people in an elevator, and Paul used the reading and viewing buddy teammate. And and you know with some edits, which, which was just renamed. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it was the reading buddy. Now it's the reading and viewing buddy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry. and I I mean it's a careful analysis of the image. Um, one of the so I mean that's what I would notice I'm, first. I'm I'm bringing it up. I promise. Okay. I was wondering, Paul, you're taking a long time. I'm getting there. <laughs> Are we there yet? No. No. So I'll no. start. Well. Just give me a second. I'm almost there. Okay, start. There. Are we there now? I just have to close. Mm -hmm. And now we're there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we go. Here's the image, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the boy in the elevator, and I think he's accused of touching her. I think, mm -hmm. or just saying hello oh. to her. So, yeah. I guess you know maybe I, I'm being expecting too much from it, but it's a really careful analysis of the image and the contrast between the two characters and, um, you know, some other kinds of things that you would expect with the composition of it, mm -hmm. but it seems to be, you know, devoid of the context of, you know, the conversation, right? Like there's, there's no real mention of like race or, or Tulsa in the comment, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the question I want to raise tonight, and I'd like us to keep collecting. Like, what do we want AI to do with an image, right? Um, so, and and these experiments are just starting to ask that. And I've done a couple of things. I found the I found that the reading buddy is the most open it just says it just says what's there and asks some questions and tries to get you engaged right in the text um do we need to read through this or or sure. is chris's yeah okay i can i can read it okay yeah. let me let me set it up a little more chris okay. by yeah. saying this i did find this is one where i found when i went in and just said hey Here's this image, and here's what you have to do. You have to pass the URL of the image um, through, your, through your prompt. So there's the URL. 
when I just said, hey, here's an image, it, it made up lots of things it, it, um, about the Tulsa. It, just, it was just all over the place. So what I found I had to do was I said, okay, this is an awkward moment. This is what I see here. Here's your here's the image. Can you give me a description of this, right? So that was the first setup. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. Well, with that background in mind, I guess I anyway. So no, uh, right. says, "Wow, what an intriguing image to share with us." Let's delve into the details together. In this encounter on the elevator, we see two individuals adorned in striking, contrasting outfits. One figure is dressed in a pristine white outfit, exuding an aura of elegance and authority while the other person is clad in a darker attire that suggests a sense of mystery and solidity. The juxtaposition of light and dark creates a dynamic visual tension that immediately pulls us in. What's captivating here is the contrast, not just in their clothing, but in their expressions and stances. The person in the white appears calm and composed, almost regal, while the person in the dark attire has a more intense, focused demeanor, suggesting perhaps a tension or unspoken conflict between them. This visual dialogue between the two characters makes us curious about their relationship in the context of their meeting. Another fascinating detail is the elevator setting itself. Elevators are often confined spaces that amplify the intensity of interactions. It's almost like they're in a pressure cooker where every gesture, every glance becomes magnified. This makes us wonder about the purpose of their encounter. Are they allies, adversaries, or strangers thrown together by circumstance? One mystery that hovers around this image is the story that brought them to this moment. <coughs> the background elements are minimal, directing all our attention on the two figures. It's a snapshot filled with potential narratives. We can almost feel the weight of unspoken words and the anticipation of what might happen next. Let's reflect on this and consider how much, how such scenes can speak volumes, even in silence. What do, what do we feel drawn to in this image's story? How do these visual elements guide our understanding of this encounter? We have so much rich material here to explore together. Okay, thoughts, questions, ideas? <laughs> and, and there's lots of ways to go here. One is, one is the fact, I, I just want to say, or take a moment to say that as of Monday, we couldn't do this. We couldn't ask AI to describe an image to us, right? But now we need to ask, how do we want it to describe an image to us? And I just built this out of what we had built before around reading, right? So if I haven't said that, I'm going to try to shut up and hear what you're thinking. Well, I guess one of my first thoughts is uh, asking AI to maybe consider how the image relates to the text around it. You, you know, even mm -hmm. if I there's a news article and there's a photo, um, you know, like there's there's a connection between the story and the photo, sometimes not so uh, direct. So like, you know, maybe in the prompt it could be, can, can you explain this image in, in context with the surrounding text or something? Mm -hmm. um, one of the routines that the Library of Congress has for their primary sources is they have kids first look exactly the way this uh, chat looked, just describing what they can see literally. So, you mm -hmm. know, describe what you see, and then what is in, and the second part being, what is the implication of what you see? What are, what can you surmise? What can you, um, the thing that's not taken into account is that it's captioned. I just looked at the article. The article has the same caption as you've got in uh, on the picture. The most common mm -hmm. explanation is that Rowland just stepped on pages foot after the door is closed. I think that context belongs with that image. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's a um, figure caption, that I would think would be part of reading the image. Uh -huh. I want to switch for a second and ask Bonnie to talk about this image. Did, did another image come up? Bonnie, you still here? Yes, yes, okay. that still come up. Mm -hmm. So this image is used in an article in an article that your students are using now, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, um, it's not an article, it's the it's chapter. A chapter, sorry. chapter seven, politics from the 1619 project. Mm -hmm. 
And this is the image that they use to open that chapter. Um, and, and I think specifically because the flag is on the woman's dress. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, <coughs> voting, voting rights changing at certain times. But it's very interesting to hear how my students describe Yeah, talk, talk about that. Did you have them talk about the image? Uh, I really didn't. I really oh, don't wow. have them focus on it. But this year, okay. many of them did. Um, and people were saying she was a working woman and, you know, and she worked really hard, but she loved the country. And then other people were saying she was a slave. And I'm saying to myself, well, how is she a slave with that dress on? And, mm -hmm. You know, look at her dress. Look at the buttons. She has a flag. Her hands are clean. You know, them young people not really paying attention to detail to read the image. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how um, GPT reads the images now. Would you um, would would you be willing to read what we came up with here? Can you see it? Okay, wait. I I'm, I blew it up. Okay. Oh, it came up with something. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. This is such an evocative and historically rich image. We're looking at an ambrotype. Oh, the, the okay. Photograph of an unidentified washerwoman who worked for the Union Army around 1865. So it read the uh, caption because I think yeah, the probably, caption yeah. does say washerwoman and in Richmond, Virginia. This image is held by the photographic historic history collection in the Division of Information Technology and Communications at the National Museum of American History. Okay. Da, da, da. Let's little, just little throat fun. clearing there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Let's just now, and I'll say this because so much comes up with Chat GPT, sometimes I'm losing my students. Mm -hmm. right. you know, yeah. So know, much that comes up. So You're losing let's me just too. take okay. a moment and then I tell them, you know, wait, wait a minute, just get just get into it a little. Let's mm -hmm. just take a moment to reflect on the depth and meaning wrapped up in this photograph. And I'm glad it said that to them, mm -hmm. to me. First, the washerwoman is not identified, which immediately makes us wonder about her personal story. Who was she? What was her life like working for the Union Army during such a turbulent time in American history? She must have lived through and experienced so much change and struggle. This photograph was taken in Richmond, Virginia, right around the end of the Civil War. So it captures not just a person, but a moment in time where the country was at a crossroads. You know, I, mean, this, I mean, so this is a lot of conversation. These are a lot mm -hmm. of spaces and places to go. And also I have to talk about how students really don't even recognize the fact that many of their family members came from the South to the North during the great American migration, because we don't talk about that much either. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, their connection, and they don't think their families came from the South. And then when you ask them, well, where did you go in the summertime? And they said, oh, we went down South. Okay, well, who was there? <laughs> you know, all these conversations come up. Um, mm -hmm. And in the Civil War, the history-loving children, they would love to hear about the Civil War, and they would take a whole different um, lane. Now, I'm thinking of all these different things myself as an adult, and the population of students that I serve, how many different lanes can I go in this one image with right. my students? I'm I, I, I just going to forge ahead a little bit um, mm -hmm. just to say that I did try the background knowledge teammate too. Okay. It does a decent job. Of, yeah, uh, it was decent. It, it, um, what the background knowledge teammate is trained to do is take you through some steps say here's here's what here's what's in this thing mm. um here are some questions to ask here's some vocabulary to learn and then so it's it's a whole little inquiry it does probably too much i get it but mm. that's how that set up to do and then i highlighted and something mm -hmm. you can do on now comment right i highlighted the flag and asked the question. Did mm -hmm. And asked the question. Did you notice the flag? And then, and then, in a reply, asked the reading buddy again. 
Again, you have yes, to feed it, you have to feed it the um, URL to the image. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. You, you, yes, I did notice the flag. It's fascinating how small details hold so much significance. This image of the unidentified washerwoman who worked for the Union Army is absolutely compelling. The presence of a flag, a Union flag, hence at her dedication and perhaps her sense of belonging or loyalty to the cause she served. It's as if we can almost feel the atmosphere of the era, the sense of urgency, the hopes and struggles tied to the war effort. And for me, it's not just the war effort, but the politics of the nation at that time, because that- Which you would, which you would put in the reply, politics. by the way. <laughs> oh, I put that in my reply? Oh, oh, okay. I, I, okay. I hope you would, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it introduces the topic politics. However, that flag was an editorial choice, and it, it was a great mm -hmm. editorial choice. Um, and I never even thought of it in this way. Um, so I'm glad it's there. I'm just going to flash a few more things. You, we don't need to read through the whole thing. I tried this basket painting. That's good. Right? That children are wearing Bosque. all the time now. Everybody okay. is wearing basket t-shirts, hats, jackets. So it says, so it identifies the title. You like it, it, big deal. It can do that, right? But then it says, yeah, there's the figure. You know, it does a decent job of getting. It doesn't do. You know, it's it's not it's not like a. I don't know if this is good or bad. I think it's actually a decent thing that the buddy, the reading buddy, doesn't go into a lot of detail, but it goes into enough and then comes back out and says, "Hey, what do you think? Let's keep talking." Right. That's the idea of it. But we need to think about what questions we want to ask, we wanted to ask. I uh, wanted to show one more thing, and it's this one, right? Another painting I experimented with. With this one, I, I created, very quickly, created a description teammate that says, hey, pretend like the person can't see the painting, describe mm -hmm. it, be an ant on the painting, start in the upper left-hand corner, mm -hmm. move across the painting and describe what you see here. And so the description teammate does this. Starting at the left mm -hmm. corner, there's predominantly white background. It goes into quite a lot of detail in describing this, right? I got I got to say, again, the value of it, I, I keep asking about. I don't know. Right. But the fact that it that can, it can do, do it. it is... It can do it. Like, <laughs> oh, my God, right? Mm -hmm. it would, I would, would I, I guess what I would do Mm -hmm. Oh no, she froze. Would be to trump um, what AI could do. I would want students to be able to do some sort of visual analysis and then critique the AI version of that analysis. What's missing? What's different from that mind? Or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because I, like maybe some of your students, are overwhelmed by the amount of description that AI is giving, and I'm feeling ignorant rather than powerful mm -hmm. when it does it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm feeling less. Oh, yeah. that's, a, that's a fair point. Yeah. It is. And so with that in mind, what I've been doing is telling students when you um, use AI through the thinking partners, because I always call them thinking partners, through the thinking partners, tell it you'd like two or three suggestions or two or three alternatives or two or three options. Because if, if you don't tell it that, it just it writes a mini dissertation and the students aren't there. I think um, one benefit of this is also scaffolding how to help students read images on the one hand, because you could imagine, you know, um, telling uh, chat to just go out and, you know, summarize all the people who've 
analyze that painting mm -hmm. it, and fill it, you know, and give them the answer there. So I think it's, it is good to kind of get them thinking about how to read images. Cause I think my students don't read it as carefully as some of those questions would prompt them to. So that seems positive. Mm -hmm. Paul, I have a question just in terms of the mm -hmm. breadth. I mean, every, consistently ChatGPT provides full-blown essays, almost like magazine publishing level ready essays, right? <laughs> um, yeah, but we're not using ChatGPT. Right. So, so we're, question, we're in control of it. We can say, yeah, just give that's me two my question. So, yeah. so, for, so when you create a prompt, if you want to, you can create it and say, I need it to be no long, I need it to be 100 words or less. Mm -hmm. And I want you to be, and I want you to end it with a leading question. Full stop. Unfor so, unfortunately, we found, and I've found in some of the materials that yeah. that it doesn't know words. <laughs> what? So, so what? it it you can tell it paragraphs, and you can tell it bullet points. Um, oh, okay. And there is it get it gets a little tricky. Like it tries to put everything. If you say, "Give me one paragraph." Mm -hmm. tries to put everything into one really long paragraph mm. but <laughs> mm. but yes we can play with this yes it's hey, puzzling i mean i've been when i i gate jet the generic version all the time in order to keep from getting totally swamped and it does a pretty good job of that of, um, of limiting words yeah I'll, mm -hmm. I'll keep trying but i don't know yeah. phyllis you want to say something looks like your hand is up huh yeah yeah so uh, and again just in in terms a, you know, a thought that I would have that as this thing becomes smarter and it becomes, and it's, it may be things, it could see things in a more complex way that maybe we haven't seen before. I mean, if its IQ is 10x with every generation greater, what's to say that it's not, you know, seen something that we missed? And I don't know, you know, I would. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, no. but we don't we don't want it to tell us everything though, right? We, mm -hmm. What we want it we want what we want it but to that's do. That's his is, job. It, it's it, no, I'm it's sorry. not. No, no. See, that's Phyllis. That's that's what we're trying to. That's the cultural sort of norm that we're trying to change. I think. Mm -hmm. But we I think want that, it to be. We want it to be so smart that it doesn't give students answers. But it's right? it's it's job is basically that's what is. is its job is to find answers, right? So now no. to tell you this is your no. job, no? No, not okay. necessarily. We can control what it does. But but absolutely, that's what people think it is. Well, OK. Do you hear that at all? I mean, I, I, I don't mean to be you know, pushing against it, but I, I mean, it was I, designed. I think we, we can, we can it was design. It was designed to find answers. That's its design. That's its ultimate design is to find answers. I, I mean, no, what I, I don't. What if it's, it's designed to re generate responses? How about yes. that word? Okay. All right. And I, I see where you're going, Paul. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I just, and, and and the stance of an educator to provide a setting for students to feel confident with their own question making and their own thinking. Feels Which to is be where not, Debbie was was before she got locked up. But yeah, go ahead. yeah. I mean, I, I think it's an important distinction. I mean, it, it it will vector towards an answer and a response, and it will vector towards cheerful, optimistic encouragement, and all these other sort of built-in traits. But you can, you know, the, 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 you, you you can you can you can mod you can you can choose what its context is and how far it goes in its ability in its responses. <laughs> Okay, but David, I, David I, I just want to say, I, I don't think the models do that as much as the programming that happens between the models and the and and the uh, products do it. Right. I guess but the thing I, about it know. is that we, yeah. how do we make it not to be the authority? How do we still allow for children, educators, to to say, hey, what do you think? That might not be the standard fare. How do how do we make this not be the new, like, hey, this is right? Because, you know, yeah. you're. Yeah, I think what we need to do is that Khan Academy approach, which they are given, the AI is given the uh, director that it is not to give kids the answers. It is to coach kids by asking questions. 
about what the kid has written or the part of the problem, math problem the kid is on. So how do we create a visual coach that says, why don't you start at one point in this picture and tell me what you see and mm -hmm. have the kid then write something and then have the AI say, did you notice that the, the image is red? How does that affect what you are looking at? I mean, I think that would feel very much more comfortable, wouldn't it, to a kid? Mm -hmm. I like that for sure. But I think that the overarching concern still remains. It's like, how do we make sure that, you know, that it doesn't become the authority. And and I hear what you're saying, Paul, and I, I agree that there's safeguards, there's real, there's guardrails, sure, today. And maybe they exist and maybe they're perfectly fine today. And that's not even thinking about the singularity and what can happen after that. But let's just say for sake of argument, you're you're completely correct. What how do we make it not become the authority? It still allows that's, a, that's exactly what we're that's a really good definition of what we're trying to do with thinking partners, I think. We're trying to make it, I mean, you know, Debbie's reference to Khan Academy, we're doing a, sort of the same thing. We're trying to make, we're trying to make thinking partners that sit alongside kids thinking and, and doesn't, doesn't get in the way of it, right? And, you know, we're successful sometimes and not other times. And this is our first, first rush into, and so I, Again, I think the big question is, how do we want to program this thing to be able to read images alongside of our kids and not get in the way of their reading them too, but still give them some good questions to think about? Maybe it is just, you know, here are three good questions about this image, right? Yeah. I, I'm even thinking about the journalistic point and the editorial point, point of view. You know, why was that particular image chosen to um, st stand, uh, to be aligned with this text, um, which is a deeper question, you know, however, it's, it's still, you know, people are making choices as to what we see, what we hear, and what we read all the time. And so AI is making these choices as well. What, what, what's the drive? Where is that drive coming from? Who, who, why are these choices being made? And, and you know, over and over again, as a Black person, you know, I'm really on this stuff. Okay, how is it making these decisions? And how is it presenting information? And whose voice is in it? And whose thinking is behind it? And, 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 and are, are people who look like me going to be left behind again? You know, I think that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting thing that you say. And I, I wonder, like, I don't know about anybody else, but political cartooning was a very difficult course for me in college. It, it was very painful because so often I, just, I, I oh, do we lose somebody? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. yeah so often. Yeah, I, the time, so yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Just so often I, I couldn't understand the political backdrop or it didn't apply to me in some way. But I still got something out of it. I mean, I still remember thinking to myself, well, OK, you know, I still look at that cartoon and I still got something out of it, despite the fact that usually my interpretation of it was wrong, you know, <laughs> but I still felt that I got something out of it. And I and I still it, it haunts me all these years later, you know, so. I, I don't know. I mean, there's there's the authority, but there's also what each of us brings to it. Even though maybe I didn't bring the same thing, maybe you know my background didn't wasn't sophisticated enough to understand the full ramifications, right? I still brought something to it. Mm -hmm. it, it was that so bad? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. And that's you know that's the that's that's one of the aspects to really think deeply about concerning AI, the perspective, whose perspectives are we um, being fed now? So, all right, I, all I want to say is this, I, 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 Bonnie, your, your description of why was this image, I mean, 
the politics article uh, chapter would be an ac a really good example of this, right? Yes. And and you could ask now what we can do now. And I just want to try to ask other people to start, or if you have already, it's great, but start thinking in this way. Um, if you think that's a that's a good thing to do, like how did these images get chosen? Mm -hmm. um, if you put into, you can go and you can select the whole document. You right. can say, here's the, here's the image here at the top of this document. Why was this image put in here? But we need to think about how we can guide the AI to answer that in a way that isn't, doesn't just give the answer that, you know, creates a dialogue. But I think it's possible. Okay. Is that, okay. Make any sense? Yes. It All could right. be, it could yeah. be including, um, I, I haven't tried it. You could have AI ask the student, here's an image what do you, uh, of the image, what do you see? Mm -hmm. What do you think it means? Mm -hmm. What evidence do you have for that idea? Or something like some, some version of those Library of Congress questions, but the chat being the asker rather than the answerer. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, and I think, I think there is some mixture of saying this is, you know, this painting by Renoir was done, you know, what do you think about it, right? So mm -hmm. there, there could be some Look guiding question. Way. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, in the question. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Debbie, um, try, try the um, the way you're doing it through ChatGPT, and I'll try a now comment version. I said we were going to get back to that. Okay. But, yeah, uh, if you if you can send me that link to the postcards, that would be helpful. Oh, and yeah, I, and I'll, I, we'll work the, on that. To, yep. Okay. Cool. The other thing I did was I asked ChatGPT, "Can you find me um, a third image um, about this uh, here about this event?" And then when it found it, I said, "What does this image add to what we know?" Hmm. Mm. Um, so. I think it's in the comparison and uh, analysis of multiple sources that we're going to get a variety of, I think for students, for students to pick what needs to be compared and why it needs to be compared gives an agency, hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I, mean, I think anytime nice. we yeah. have them making the choices. Yes, yes. That's right. They shouldn't be told. Told. They should be able to think through the choices that they make. I, I stand on that, Debbie. Thank you. All right. It's we a will fascinating thing. Thank you so much for bearing yeah, and, with me. And, and we're just touching the surface of what this model can do. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. And Debbie, you took me back about 10, well, not 10 years. I read um, Mob Madness and a Party Down at the Square, and I show the lynching postcards. Oh. Yeah, I do all of that because the students don't really realize that that occurred less than 50 years ago. In this I country. know, and usually when these images are presented, they're presented as images that you have to actually read the, 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 the documentation, the metadata. Mm -hmm. uh, documentation to understand that these are sold as postcards. I mean, that, yeah. that just, every time I hear that, that just shows me. Mm -hmm. Imagine putting a stamp and saying, hi, I wish you were here. By the, way, by, the way, by the way, one of the questions I have for this model is to what degree is it reading the metadata? Mm -hmm. like, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And because and when, when it's just a photograph that doesn't have metadata, it, it makes things up kind of off. Yeah, you seem so, to. Uh, off so yeah, we're not up with such authority, yeah. though. <laughs> you can contextualize it. It doesn't look around it itself unless you tell it to. Yeah. No, but what I was saying is, I think it gets a lot of its information from the metadata of the of the photograph. <laughs> it does. Yeah. So that's that's an, but that's interesting to know, right? And to yeah. to help to know how to use it. All right. 
I'm okay. gonna cut this off. Thank All you, Phyllis. Right. Phyllis, you have to get up in three hours. Come on. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Debbie, thank you time, that was a really cool thank presentation. You, thank you. Oh, thank you, Debbie. Good night, night, Paul. Good night. Thank you, guys. Good night, everybody. See you around. Bye. Bye-bye.